This video is supported by Brilliant.org. About a year ago, I did a video on nuclear fusion and how close we actually are to having nuclear fusion as an energy source. Because there's actually a bit of a race going on right now, and there's a lot happening. It turned out to be a pretty popular video. In fact, it's the fourth most watched video in the channel, but that might just be because I introduced the world to a couple of really awesome bands. This Sunday at the Poughkeepsie Civic Center, Tokamak featuring Stellarator. Ages five and up. What, I paid a guy for that graphic. Yeah, I'm gonna use it twice. So if you haven't watched that video from last year, that might be a good place to start. I'll put a link right here. But one of the things that I talked about in that video was how, you know, nuclear fusion has been about 50 years away for about 50 years now. And there's been multiple waves of different technologies that have come and gone. But this time it is kind of different. This time there are new ideas being tested, some of them created by supercomputers and AI, and it's not just public agencies anymore, there's also private companies that are getting involved and they're backed by some serious money. And if there's one thing that's true about the human race, it's that money makes things happen. And there is a lot of money to be made for somebody who corners this market. So with all that in mind, there has been some notable breakthroughs in the world of nuclear fusion, and we're going to talk about a few of them right now. Now before we jump into the list here, just in case there's so many noobs out there that aren't familiar with why this is such a big deal, I'm going to pwn you with some knowledge. This will be fun. I haven't pwned a noob in a while. Mostly because nobody's used that term in like 10 years. Our world runs on electricity. Without it, we pretty much get sent back to the Victorian age, which was a nightmare. Yeah, we don't want to go back to that. In almost every way that we make energy involves turning a turbine that then powers a generator that makes electricity. Almost every different type of electricity is just a different way of turning a turbine. Hydroelectric uses dams and rivers to direct water over a turbine that turns the generator. Wind uses big huge blades to capture wind power that turns a turbine. Coal, natural gas, and nuclear are all really steam generators. They basically heat water to the boiling point and then the pressure caused from that steam turns a turbine, makes electricity. Solar really is the only type of electricity generation that doesn't use some kind of turbine power to get it done. It just basically collects photons and turns them into electrons. It's more passive and less active. Of course, all of these power sources have their issues. Not everybody lives next to a dam or a river for hydroelectric. It's not windy everywhere in the world. The sun isn't always shining. And uh, the coal and the oil and the natural gas, those create greenhouse gases and nuclear creates toxic sludge that could kill people for 10,000 years. And another thing about coal, oil, natural gas, and nuclear is that we have to extract stuff out of the ground to make that work. So that actually takes more energy to get that fuel. And, you know, it's a limited resource. We are eventually gonna run out of that. But nuclear fusion's got none of those flaws. The fuel is cheap and abundant. You can do it anywhere, anytime. There's very little waste product associated with it. It's almost the perfect energy source except for one major flaw. And it's that we can't do it. Turns out pretty high up on the list of mandatories for an energy source is, you know, that it work. Now to be fair, we can do it. We can fuse hydrogen into helium and create energy out of that. But the problem is that we put more energy in than we get out, which is Obviously, not the idea. Fusion energy, of course, involves smashing hydrogen atoms together and fusing them into helium atoms, which produces massive amounts of energy. It basically is what the sun does. And this is usually done by confining a superheated plasma of hydrogen ions inside of a magnetic field in a donut-shaped torus called a stellarator or a tokamak. Although there are some newer designs being explored that use a sphere shape or a cylindrical shape to sort of smash the hydrogen atoms together from all directions and create energy that way. So anyway, that gives a, a basic rundown. Again, if you want to go over all the details, I'll put the link to the old video down in the description that kind of spells it all out for you. But long story short, what we're trying to do is improve on these designs that we already have out there so that we can get it to where we're putting less energy in than we're getting out. Net positive energy, basically. And that leads me to the first breakthrough. China's artificial sun reaches 100 million degrees. I talked in the last video about China's EAST reactor, which stands for Experimental Advanced Superconducting Tokamak. It's been operating since about 2006, and it's one of the largest tokamak reactors in the world. Well, in November of last year, they broke records by sustaining a plasma for over 10 seconds at 100 million degrees. Now, if 100 million degrees sounds hot, it's 
Because it is, that's six times hotter than the inside of the sun, and it's capable of producing 10 megawatts of energy. So this was not only one of the hottest temperatures ever achieved in a reactor, it was also one of the longest times that plasma has been sustained, which is kind of the biggest problem in nuclear fusion, is sustaining that super hot plasma. Now in this case, they were able to sustain this plasma using a few different techniques, including lower hybrid wave heating, which means oscillating the ions and electrons in the plasma, Electron cyclotron wave heating, which means using a static magnetic field and a high frequency electromagnetic field. Ion cyclotron resonance heating, which means accelerating ions inside a cyclotron. And neutral beam ion heating, or injecting a beam of accelerated neutral particles into the plasma. I mean, you know, those are pretty obvious things. <laughs> Scientists at East are going to continue working on this. They're combining different methods or adding and subtracting here and there. Uh, the goal being to get the plasma to go longer and longer until it becomes self-sustaining. Princeton stabilizes plasma with RF waves. Now the trouble with plasma and the reason it's so hard to stabilize is because plasma is basically a superheated fluid, which means fluid dynamics come into play. And fluid dynamics are chaos. And you know, that makes it beautiful to look at. All the little swirling eddies, the chaos, you never know where anything's gonna go. That's what, you know, fluid dynamics is. All these tiny little particulate pieces of matter being worked on by forces that are, you know, working on all the little neighboring particulates around it. It causes chaos and randomness and it's, it's nice to look at, but if you're trying to create a stable plasma, that's kind of your worst enemy. So the scientists of the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, or the PPPL, working along with the Department of Energy, have found a way to possibly keep this chaos in check using radio frequency waves. In a paper published in Physical Review Letters in January this year, what they found was that these swirling particles can create what they call magnetic bubbles or magnetic islands in the plasma. And it's these little bubbles that can trigger disruptive events that can make the plasma unstable. So their idea was to use radio frequency waves to create what they call RF current condensation. It's basically a concentration of radio waves right in the middle of that bubble to keep it from getting any bigger. Smaller bubbles means less disturbance to the plasma. Less disturbance means more of that sweet, sweet plasma stability. The study was led by physicists Alan Ryman and Nat Fish, both of whom look exactly like the scientists at the beginning of every disaster movie that nobody takes seriously. But let's hope their work is taken seriously when projects like ITER come online in the next 10 years. TAE announces their Copernicus reactor. One of the most exciting aspects of the new fusion race, if not the most exciting aspect of it, is the fact that private companies are getting involved in this now. And one of those private companies is called TAE, used to stand for Tri-Alpha Energy. They've been working on fusion energy for about 20 years now, but have recently raised over $500 million from such players as Google and Microsoft based off the success of their Norman reactor. This is a type of reactor known as the Colliding Beam Fusion Reactor, or CBFR, in a field reverse configuration. And in 2017, they were able to create plasma with it at 20 million degrees. This is a design that they're still tweaking, and they plan to make break-even energy with it in the next few years, but in January, they announced their next generation reactor called the Copernicus Reactor. This, simply put, is a scaled-up fusion reactor that they think will be online and energy positive by 2023. Obviously, an energy positive reactor is something that can be commercialized and sold all around the world, which would put them at the head of the market. Now, first to market doesn't mean it's going to be the one that comes out on top. Remember the Zune. But all disruptions start small. It's like a dam holding back a lake full of water. Before it breaks, there's always a leak. Physicists flip the D. Oh yeah, they flip the D. Just last week, a paper was published in the Physical Review Letters that uh, showed an experiment that was done in San Diego that sounds really simple, but apparently worked. So basically, if you do a cross-section of a tokamak reactor, you get something of a D-shape with the flat part of the D on the inside of the torus. Well, these scientists got a hold of an old tokamak reactor called the D-I-I-I-D, or, may or maybe it's D3D, I don't know, there's a lot of Ds in here. And they basically reversed that. Yeah, they reconfigured the reactor so that the flat part of the D was on the outside instead of on the inside. They thought this might actually help create a more stable plasma. Turns out they weren't wrong. So the way they break it down is there's a couple of different types of plasma. There's H-mode plasma and L-mode plasma. H-mode is tighter, more constricted, and hotter, but it's also more unstable. Whereas L-mode is not as constricted and it's not as hot. In fact, it's not nearly hot enough to actually produce fusion, but they use it so that they can study different types of plasma. So the researchers created an L-mode plasma in that reverse D shape, and what they found was that 
it actually got hot enough well past the point where it would normally turn into an H mode plasma, but it still stayed in that L mode plasma, and it even had pressures that were high enough to create fusion in a typical reactor. Now this DIID reactor didn't have enough power to actually create any kind of fusion out of it, but they've been doing this long enough that they know how this, these kinds of energies scale up to bigger reactors, and they're able to say with pretty good confidence that if done in a bigger reactor, this could actually produce a much more stable plasma. Now this sounds incredibly simple, and you might wonder why they never did this before, but uh, that shape, that D shape in the tokamak reactor had been done that way for many years for lots of different reasons that might not work in this new configuration. Not to mention, in order to reconfigure a large tokamak reactor for that, you basically have to like completely tear it apart and start over from scratch, so it would cost millions of dollars to do this. It's still interesting stuff that they found out, but we don't know for sure if this will ever come to fruition. Now whether any of these individual breakthroughs ever come to fruition or not is not really the point. The point is this is just a few of dozens of advancements and breakthroughs that have happened just in the last year. And that's what it's going to take to get to this ultimate energy source. You know, we love this idea of the, the renegade scientist that goes off and has a eureka moment and comes up with some breakthrough idea, but really it's usually done in tiny, tiny increments over and over and over again, whittling down at the problem until you get it right. Yes, fusion has been a long time coming. And yeah, it's still probably going to be another 10 years or so before a fusion reactor is powering any homes, much longer before they're everywhere. But there is reason to be hopeful. I cover a lot of scary doom and gloom stuff on this channel, but I'm happy to say that this is one of those topics that has a steady stream of positive good news coming out of it, so I'm really optimistic about this. And there's a good life lesson here, you know? Chipping away at big problems to create smaller problems that you can solve a little bit at a time is a great way to go through life. And if you want to be better at solving problems, one good place to start is the daily problems feature on Brilliant.org. You've heard me talk about Brilliant before. You know they're the online learning platform that teaches you core scientific concepts by walking you through a series of problems so that you can learn to think like a scientist. But they've also got daily problems that help you build a daily learning habit. Every day you can take five minutes or so to solve a daily problem, and if you want to go further into that specific topic, you could go into one of their courses and learn more. Or not. Maybe you can just learn a random fun thing that day. Any, either way, it's, it's a fun way to engage your mind. Viewers of this channel can get free access to Brilliant's weekly brain teasers and puzzles by going to brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe. And the first 200 people that sign up for the full uh, subscription, the premium subscription that gets access to all their courses can get 20% off for life. I love it. You'll love it. Brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe. Links down in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and a huge shout out to the Patreon supporters on Patreon, the Answer Files who are helping keep the lights on around here and uh, just supporting and creating a great community. I love you guys. There's a few new people that have joined. I gotta murder their names real quick. We got Ethan Hardinger, uh, Ralph Dratman, Jason and Lucy Zellman, Nance1976, uh, Dominic Burton, Philip Carson, Robert McDougall, Grant, Katsumi Spencer, Jesse Banks, Mitchell Rodriguez, and Nathan T. Maples. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get access to me and access to them and, and early access to videos and all kinds of cool stuff, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. T-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts, fun, nerdy t-shirts, geeky stuff, uh, inside jokes that only other really cool people will get, so you'll make new friends this way. That's what I like to say. Anyway, uh, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Please like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, check out this video. Google thinks you'll like that, or any of my other videos, and if you do like them, maybe hit subscribe, because I come back every Monday and every Thursday with fun science and futurism topics. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.